So let me just take one moment to introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, Yvette Shaleen. Uh, she is currently the professor of psychiatry, radiology, and neurology in the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, notably, she's only been there since Labor Day. So this is a relatively new move for her. Prior to that, she had a similar set of appointments at Washington University in St. Louis, which as we've learned was sort of the birthplace of research on the default mode network. And it was when uh, Professor Shaleen was at Washington University that I personally first became aware of her research, where she published a number of very seminal studies on the pathophysiology, the neural systems that might go awry and function differently in major depressive disorder. And she took that work and used it to understand why some patients respond to treatment and why some patients don't. And this work has been incredibly important. Um, this work has uh, landed her numerous grants from NARSAT and NAMH. Um, and she currently uh, has taken that work uh, to the University of Pennsylvania to direct a new center for neuromodulation in depression and stress. So let's welcome uh, Yvette Shaleen. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, since it's getting near the lunch hour, I, I won't give a long and flowery um, thanks to all the organizers, although I certainly feel that. Um, and I, I'm also very grateful to be able to take a, a train from Philadelphia <laughs> and not to have to brave the airports and the connections through Chicago and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so thank you for having me here. Um, today I'm going to talk about competing, I'm going to sort of go back to the past just a bit to talk about where this work came from, the competing paradigms for depression, how do these connect with depression brain phenotypes, um, using that terrible word, limbic, <laughs> limbic abnormalities, cognitive control abnormalities, um, negativity bias in depression, um, and how these explain some of the phenomenology of depression. And I'll give a few examples in literature. Um, and then the brain resting state networks that reveal abnormalities in functional connectivity, including the default mode network, but not limited to it. Um, Similarities with other negative valence to use the new mandatory NIMH uh, word, which is the RDOC construct, um, including uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and then finally some new directions. So um, where have we come from? Um, starting sort of in the 60s and 70s, we had the monoamine hypothesis, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine still important, but at, at that time it was revolutionary to think of depression not as um, something to be understood through only through psychoanalysis or through um, lack of willpower, but that there actually could be a chemical imbalance. In the 70s, we had um, 70s on into 80s, we had uh, a new understanding of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the fact that there are neuroendocrine disturbances, that cortisol uh, ran amok in people with depression. Um, and then in the 90s, we, for the first time, we found, oh, actually depression may be a brain illness. There are structural abnormalities um, modulated by neurotrophic factors and by neurogenesis. And then um, the most recent way of looking, and I would say sort of starting with the, in 2000s and on up loosely, we've been looking at brain circuits and network abnormalities. And I'm sure this will be superseded by yet another paradigm to understand things, but for now I think this is a, a very valuable and, and really um, does give us a whole new purchase on understanding depression. So um, in the labs of Sapolsky and McEwen, there was this interesting paradigm where if you stressed a rodent or gave it large um, amounts of cortisol, you saw an atrophy of the apical dendrites in the hippocampus. Um, and up to a certain point in time, there was plasticity. So um, if you, you know, restored normal uh, cortisol balance or stopped stressing the animal, it would recover. Um, but beyond a certain point, it was non-recoverable. Um, and we, we took that paradigm um, almost 20 years ago to try and understand, could this also be in, true in humans? And at that time, we, we had the brand new 1.5 Tesla scanner, <laughs> and uh, we had high resolution MRI. And so we could look in the hippocampus to see what the volume was in depressed patients compared to controls. And we found 
lo and behold, that um, the hippocampus was smaller, which makes sense because it is the air brain area with the densest um, cortisol receptors. Um, following that, it was discovered that actually um, neurotrophic factors were modulators, that it wasn't just this glutamatergic process, but that there were um, especially brain-derived neurotrophic factors, but other neurotrophic factors that also modulated. Um, and then this um, really exciting finding by Rusty Gage and his group and others showing that if you had rodents and you put them either in a really great rodent environment with lots of toys or you gave them running wheels, um, lo and behold, these red guys here are the, the brand new just birthed neurons. So you can see there's a dramatic increase in, in these kinds of interventions. On the other hand, if you stressed um, rodents, they had a decrease in neurogenesis. And um, while we don't have imaging technology to show in vivo how this happens in humans, um, there are studies conducted here at Columbia by Vicki Arango and her group showing that in humans who were exposed to antidepressants before death, they had more neurogenesis than, uh, than depressed patients who were not. So it, it clearly is relevant and uh, it would be great if we had a way of showing that in the, in the living human as well. So what I'm really trying to say here, just to um, summarize very, very quickly so we can move on to, to other things, is that there's this bimodal direction, that there's um, stress and negative affect affect structure and structure in turn feeds back on uh, stress and negative affect. Um, and that we have to see it as a push-pull relationship. So if we, ha if we know we have some neurochemical or structural changes um, in a depressed brain, how do they translate to behavioral changes that we see? And are there relevant animal models and behavioral paradigms that we could use to understand that better? Um, and um, just across town is the laboratory of Joe Ledoux um, at NYU, and um, he was the person who really developed this snake fear paradigm and other paradigms to understand the, the, the pathophysiology of reaction to danger. Um, if you're going to survive, you have to have a very, very fast means of sensing the danger and reacting to it before the snake gets you. Even if it turns out just to be a log, you have to be primed to, to experience it as something that's potentially life-threatening. And so he coined this term of the low road and the high road. This, this happens um, out of conscious um, thought. It happens automatically and then gets elaborated in the, in the cortex to understand actually what's happening. Um, and so um, building on the work of Paul Whelan, who first showed that you could use masked uh, faces to examine uh, the hippocampal and amygdala response in, in humans, uh, we, we did the same kind of experiment in people with depression. Um, and um, at that time, look at using faces was pretty new. <laughs> Um, and there, there have probably been thousands of studies since then. At that time, we, we thought it was really novel and cool. Um, and what we found was that people with depression had higher activation of the amygdala to fearful faces, but also um, had higher activation to all faces. Um, and so our interpretation was maybe they really have increased vigilance towards the external environment. The environment is sensed as a more potentially dangerous place, um, and that's why there is this, this difference. Um, so that, that sort of s looked at the amygdala and had an amygdalocentric view of <coughs> what depression was, and we wanted to find other paradigms that would give us a little bit better um, understanding of how limbic regions interacted with, with cognitive regions and other brain regions. And so we used this implicit emotional regulation affect. This is um, a very fast task in which the person in, might be asked, for instance, to attend to the horizontal direction, and their task would be press this button if the houses are the same or different. Press one button if they're the same, press a different button <coughs> if they're different. But then these faces are intervening, so they're having to pay attention to two tasks at once, essentially. Um, and, um, oh, got my calendar in here. <laughs> 
I've got to pay attention to two tasks at once. <laughs> so what we found was that in depressed patients, they had increased activity to, um, in the amygdala when fearful faces were present, and they had decreased activity uh, in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So both of those were going on at the same time, as well as um, some other responses, increased activity in the subgenual cingulate, another um, limbic part of the, um, of the default mode network as well. Um, and you know, since then, people have looked at a variety of different brain regions. In the early 2000s, people were sort of, because of the, the problem in the literature of correcting for multiple comparisons, you were safer looking at one region at a time versus multiple regions because otherwise you'd have to correct for how many different regions you were looking at and all your significance would go away and you wouldn't have a paper. But so people would sort of choose their favorite regions to examine and um, a number of different regions were implicated in depression, primarily decreased activity during tasks in the prefrontal cortex, um, uh, decreased activity in the anterior cingulate where there's sort of conflict resolution between emotional tasks and, and um, cognitive control tasks. Um, as I said before, increased activity in amygdala. Um, and interestingly, in some studies also, increased activity in, in insular cortex, and you've heard some about the importance of that region. Um, and so in our simplistic, so we had moved from looking just at amygdala, now we've gotten as far as three regions. The cingulate, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and the amygdala was kind of where we were um, at that point, just trying to understand in a simple way what was going on when people were responding to these, these um, control tasks. Um, so as I've said, we had found enhanced amygdala activation when they were ignoring the fearful stimuli an overall increase in the subgenual cingulate, um, decreased dorsal anterior cingulate, um, and failure to recruit the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. There's a, an interesting finding in psychology, oh, there's an interesting finding in psychology where when um, you've made an error, in the next trial, you will activate dorsolateral prefrontal cortex more to sort of focus attention there. Well, the depressed uh, patients didn't do that, so um, that's another way in which they were different from controls. Um, and so can we use these findings to understand depressive phenomenology? Um, that's the important thing, right, about, about looking at these. And it's been known for a long time that actually depressed patients are better at a couple of things. They have increased attention. You can show that doing eye tracking to negative stimuli. They have enhanced memory for negative stimuli. So even though in general, when they're in a depressive episode, they, their overall memory may be worse than uh, comparison people, their attention for negative stimuli and enhanced memory for negative stimuli is better. So I think what this helps us see is that to some extent, looking at these kinds of conflictual tasks, there is some top-down deficit in attentional control, and there's also a bottom-up increase in limbic amygdala activity, and, and that so it's like, yes, yes, both and both. Um, and just to, to foreshadow future part of this talk, that amygdala is, in fact, part of the default mode network. It goes down in general when you give it a, a, a difficult task to do. Um, but there are a lot of other parts of depression that, that this can't explain. I mean, this is a very, very simple model. So physiological disturbances, um, it's well known that there are disturbances in sleep, appetite, energy level, libido, a tendency to ruminate, lack of joy, lack of pleasure, anhedonia, an inability to concentrate on tasks, loss of creativity, um, and I mean, on and on. But, those are some of the, the more complex phenomena that aren't captured by these very simple um, uh, reductive paradigms. So I'm going to turn to historical figures to understand in finer detail what that has to do with the creative process um, and um, just let some of them speak for themselves. <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll come back and speculate about what might have been going on in their brains. Um, so um, this is from the Odes of Horus, 
Then too, you cannot spend an hour alone, no company's more hateful than your own. You dodge and give yourself the slip you seek in bed or in your cups from care to sneak. In vain, the black dog follows you and hangs close on your flying skirts with hungry fangs. Um, and again, um, from Boswell, Life of Johnson, when I rise, uh, my breakfast is solitary, the black dog waits to share it. From breakfast to dinner, he continues barking, except that Dr. Brocklesby, for a little, keeps him at a distance. Night comes at last, and some hours of restlessness and confusion bring me again to a day of solitude. And then this is from commentaries on Beethoven, um, discussing how, in musical form, he portrays grief and bereavement um, that he, he, since he had, we can only speculate, bipolar disorder, um, there were sudden and alternating changes of tempo from um, rhythms that depict the mood changes, it was speculated, that occur in bipolar disorder. Um, and then also the storm movement of the Sixth Symphony, the, the distress and agitation that, that he was feeling. Um, Virginia Woolf, of course, suffered um, terribly from bipolar disorder, including psychotic episodes as well as periods of manias and, and depressions. Um, here's Sylvia Plath, um, who in this prescient uh, foreshadowing says, dying is an art like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say I've a call. Um, and so she's kind of taunting us a bit with, with how, how good she is at, at feeling this extreme pain. But I think it's also her way of expressing how, how severe that pain is. <clears throat> um, and this is more of a descriptive um, chronicle from Darkness Visible. It was really not alarming at first, since the change was subtle, but I did notice that my surroundings took on a different tone at certain times. The shadows of nightfall seemed more somber. My mornings were less buoyant. Walks in the woods became less restful. And there was a moment during my working hours in the late afternoon when a kind of panic and anxiety overtook me just for a few minutes, accompanied by a visceral queasiness. Um, what I had begun to discover is that mysteriously and in ways that are totally remote from normal experience, the gray drizzle of horror induced by depression takes on the quality of physical pain. Um, and then finally, um, from K. Redfield Jameson, um, in its severe forms, depression paralyzes all of the otherwise vital forces that make us human, leaving instead a bleak, despairing, desperate, and deadened state. Life is bloodless, pulseless, and yet present enough to allow a suffocating horror and pain. All bearings are lost, all things are dark and drained of feeling. The slippage into futility is first gradual, then utter. Thought, which is as pervasively affected by depression as mood, is morbid, confused, and stuporous. It is also vacillating, ruminative, indecisive, and self-castigating. The body is bone-weary. There is no will. Nothing is that is not an effort, and nothing at all seems worth it. Sleep is fragmented, elusive, or all-consuming. Like an unstable gas, an irritable exhaustion seeps into every crevice of thought and action. Um, and so I think, I think that absolutely captures depression in its extreme forms. And we'll come back and, and ask this again later after I go through some more of, of kind of examining what might be going on in brain circuitry. But clearly, none of these people would have been able to create had they been depressed their entire lives. So the, the point here is all of them had episodic depression. So how can we get at the mechanisms for these more complex phenomena? Obviously, we're not going to be able to, to show the complexity. But could we use conscious, effortful affect regulation, for example, which is something that depressed patients do poorly, to get information about what brain regions and networks um, are involved? Um, and so here, with thanks to Kevin Oxner, <laughs> um, who developed this paradigm for explicit affective regulation, 
um, we used that paradigm to examine what happened in patients with depression when they were told, okay, you're going to look at this picture, it's going to be on the screen, and we want you to look at it. For certain parts of the task, it's just looking, observing. Other parts, they're trained, oops, other parts, they're trained to actually uh, down-regulate negative affect. So if they saw something that was um, scary or awful, they would imagine that it was not real, that it was happening to somebody else, that it was uh, in a movie, that it couldn't affect them. Um, so they were essentially depersonalizing the experience, but they were doing it in such a way that they were um, trained to distance themselves from it. As distinct from telling somebody just to suppress it, and that's an important point, because if, if people just try to suppress it, they don't get the same affective regulation. So in some of the tasks, they would be seeing a, a neutral picture, such as this, and others, they would see um, a picture which on a big screen is pretty scary. <laughs> so you would, might want to Im imagine that fellow behind barbed wire. Um, um, and what we found was that a number of different regions had heightened activity, um, both when, when uh, patients were regulating the affect, trying to regulate, or looking. So these are left and right amygdala. But we found a variety of different regions, and I don't really want you to think so much about exactly what these are, but to notice the pattern. Here's, here are the depressed patients in the, in the thicker lines, and here are the controls. So again, sometimes it's less deactivation, sometimes it's actual activation versus deactivation. Um, and so what we did was we noticed that these regions were falling in a particular pattern, and we suspected that they would end up lining up with the default uh, mode topography. So we got an independent sample of young, healthy college kids, looked at their default mode network, and then superimposed these regions on that default mode network. What we found in red are the areas that are where there's actually a difference between depressed and controls, and the other um, yellow and other colors are just regions where across groups there were, there were differences in activity. So what you can see is that during this regulate or look task, the, the default mode was involved in appraising uh, the probably appraising the emotional context of, of the stimulus. Um, and then we used some work of our colleague Joel Price who has done beautiful um, injection studies where he has mapped out the medial and orbital system um, in rats, monkeys, cats, um, and, uh, and not humans. <laughs> but. Um, Using fMRI, we can then do the same kinds of mapping studies in humans. And interestingly, this medial network, where you see the medial prefrontal cortex with Broadman areas 9, 10, and so forth, are connected to the visceral control regions of the hypothalamus and perioaqueductal gray, and also to, to limbic areas, um, the amygdala hippocampus and perihippocampal cortex. So it's not surprising then that um, during tasks where you are activating medial prefrontal cortex or amygdala, you would also be activating these visceral regions um, that, are, that are actually intimately connected. So, th you know, that potentially explains some of the physiological imbalance. Um, and the question we were asking ourselves since by then people were studying resting state networks was, if we looked using resting state networks, would we see the same kinds of differences in default mode network that we had seen in, in these activation studies? Um, and then this, you've, you've heard about how this is done before, where you take all of the different regions, the voxels in the brain, and you look at how they're connected to all the other voxels in the brain. Um, you get a pattern from a particular region, and you can see here, here's that, the um, oscillations. Um, and then you look at how each of these regions is constructed into different networks. And you can, you can divide it up more or less finely. If you divide it up in this particular scheme, you get just these networks, default, attention, uh, control, salience, sensory motor, visual, and auditory. Um, this just shows the, the uh, particular network for sensory motor cortex. 
So using that kind of approach, we thought, well, what are the regions we're most interested in? Uh, you know, we're, we're really interested in um, picking a seed um, that is here in the affective network, the subgenual prefrontal cortex, in the control network, um, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and uh, in the precuneus uh, as representative of the default mode network. So we put seeds in each of those regions and looked at you know, what happened. And all of them, uh, all three of them converged on this region here, um, which we named the dorsal nexus because it was dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. Not quite, I think, the same area as, as uh, Nathan was telling us about, but, but close by, not quite as medial. Um, it looks like this when it's rendered, you can see here, rendered in 3D space. Um, and when we connected, when we used that region, the dorsal nexus as a seed, and then looked at how it was connected to the rest of the brain, what we saw was here on the top are control subjects, um, the lateral and medial view, and then here are the depressed subjects with much more connectivity to broad swaths of prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate and, and posterior, uh, and both here in the, on the medial aspect and the lateral aspect, and then here again on the medial aspect of the posterior cingulate. Um, so what does that imply about depression? That there are systematic alterations and connections among these different nodes, that the increased resting state connectivity with the dorsal nexus may cause an attentional shift with increased self-focus, interfering with task performance um, in the cognitive control network, and the affective network having increased connectivity of the subgenual cingulate with amygdala, hypothalamus, brainstem, and, and the nuclei involved in visceral monitoring may, through its connection with the dorsal nexus, uh, have ac acquired increased um, cogn cognitive control connections th uh, to other default uh, mode <coughs> regions and cognitive control regions. Um, and specifically, um, what we think is that this dysregulation of autonomic functioning and the heightened vigilance, the heightened self-awareness, the sort of self-referential thinking, might become the task that, that is done. In other words, as it, it's connected to the cognitive control network, what you're doing then is ruminating on visceral phenomena and obsessing about physical symptoms um, or obsessing about self-critical thoughts rather than, att than attending to the cognitive tasks that you should be doing. Um, we also found that the degree of the increased dorsal nexus connectivity um, correlated with depression severity. Um, and since then, there have there've been a number of other studies that are also looking at default mode network connectivity. Here's um, a recent one that just came out showing increased connectivity of the default mode network with the salience network using independent components analysis. Um, and before I move on and talk about other things, I just want to talk about some of the advantages of resting state studies and some of the disadvantages. The advantages are that it's, these studies are, are pretty short. You can get somebody in the scanner and get them out. Um, you can, because they don't have a task to do that requires um, an especially, um, in, you know, sophisticated idea of what to do, you can just have them lie there and even if you, even if they can't look at a crosshair, they can lie there with their eyes closed. Um, so you can do it in a seriously ill population. Um, it has a small standard deviation, which is an advantage in looking across studies, and you can measure both within network and across network connectivity. The disadvantage is that so far there's no uniformity of methods. Um, there's seed-based methods, independent components methods, uh, graphical analysis methods at a yeah, at further levels of, of uh, analysis. That repeatability is still um, not ascertained. We, we don't have studies where you can reliably get the same answer every time. Um, and movement artifacts are a major problem. We haven't talked about that here yet, but maybe some other people will. Um, and then regarding depression, it's a heterogeneous disorder. It, there's not just one depression or multiple kinds. 
Um, and the abnormalities that we see in depression aren't unique to depression. So um, following up on that latter point, we also looked in post-traumatic stress disorder to see if we would see the same kinds of abnormalities. Um, and the short answer is yes. Um, looking here again with the same kind of analysis and across three different networks, we found this increased connectivity of the default of the dorsal nexus to the, these widely um, distributed medial uh, prefrontal and posterior cingulate, more so medial prefrontal. And you can see here, here's the people with PTSD. And interestingly, these are not war veterans. These were um, women who had been exposed to intimate partner violence um, across a period of time and then had developed post-traumatic stress disorder. And, you know, I think it would be interesting, I don't know of anybody who's compared the kind of symptoms you get in that kind of PTSD versus war veteran PTSD, but I think that would be interesting. So the latest um, blitz of, of publications comes from graph analysis. Um, and in this kind of analysis, you have nodes and connections between nodes. You saw some of that um, with Nathan's work where he was showing you work from graph analysis. Um, you compute the correlations between the time series of these different nodes, and these nodes could be anything. I mean, it can be EEG data, it can be um, e, uh, MEG data, it can be um, fMRI data, it can be structural data. So you, you have a bunch of nodes and you look at how, how the correlations are, and then you can construct various um, analysis schemes. So here, for example, and I think you saw some examples of this, you can look at the correlation um, between networks. So you line up the networks on one axis and down the other axis, and then here is the identity line where networks are connected with themselves, but then how connected are they with the other networks? And then you can calculate a lot of parameters of interest, none of which I've done, <laughs> but there are, there are things like small worldness, modularity, efficiency, uh, you can calculate an, an efficiency, a cost of connections, and I think as some of these, these metrics get further developed, they will be very useful in helping to understand disorders. But you're not going to get that today because I don't have it. <laughs> um, I do have um, some support vector um, learning algorithm derived data where we classified people as either major depression or post-traumatic stress disorder using large-scale brain networks. And you can see here, I'll just point out some of these. This is the singulo opercular, um, a, a singulo opercular node. The red guys are default mode. Um, this is um, attention here, and, um, and so forth and so on. And so you can see that, well, let me go back one. Um, this is showing all of the different nodes and connections that, are, that differ in, um, in major depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. And so um, what we saw was that major depression had strong default mode salience and somatomotor connectivity compared with PTSD, which had stronger cingulo percular dorsal attention and visual connectivity. So, and I, I thought especially the visual connectivity is interesting because when you think about how people have, have become used to visual threats, um, that, that really made sense to me. Um, we also were able to take all of our subjects and group them by the age at which they had been exposed to interpersonal violence. And so this is a comparison of those who were exposed, who started to be exposed under the age of five versus older than the age of five. And so what, it's, so the early childhood trauma had greater effect on singular opercular network, default mode, dorsal attention, lateral somatomotor, and temporal networks. Um, and obviously this, this is not any sort of definitive study. It sort of just gives an idea of what you can do with analyzing the networks to, to get at some of the effects. Um, we also have looked at what you see pre and post treatment um, in neuroimaging studies. <clears throat> and this is from an older study, but what we, what we found was that af following successful antidepressant treatment, we got a decrease 
in, um, in amygdala activity and an increase, oh, you can't see this, I'm sorry, an increase in, um, in dorsolateral prefrontal activity, um, especially for negative stimuli. This is from um, newer work where um, the effects of ketamine was studied on default mode network and what they did was looked at um, a, a seed here in the, in the precuneus and then they, al they also um, found this dorsal nexus network and examined the effect of ketamine on this nexus connectivity. And what they found was that um, the connectivity from precuneus, oops, I didn't mean to do that. From precuneus to the, to the dorsal nexus <coughs> was decreased and also was um, decreased to the pregenual anterior cingulate. Um, and then they looked at the connectivity from the dorsal nexus starting at, with the dorsal nexus and looked at the connectivity to the subgenual anterior cingulate, which as, as you've heard from a couple talks is involved in affective experiencing and regulation <clears throat> and found following ketamine a decrease um, in the, in the anti-correlation with subgenual cingulate. And this is looking um, at antidepressant treatment associated structural and functional default mode network um, effects. What they did was looked um, in, and these were, I should make clear, these were people who had had depression and were recovered. And some of them were on medication and some of them um, were not. And um, some of, and then these are controls. And so what their point was that via the, the dorsal nexus, so this is, again, um, looking at the connectivity of the dorsal nexus connectivity, um, those who were potentially at risk for future depressions but were um, medicated were more like uh, controls versus those who were unmedicated. They also had this other interesting finding that I'm not going to go into, but it, I, I, I like it just because um, it gets back with a tie-in with the structural changes, and that is they did uh, a gyrification index, which as, I, as best I understand it is looking underneath a certain part of the brain to look at all the foldings underneath that particular region, and you get an, an index of how much, how much folding there is. And so they found hypogyrification in the precuneus and hypergyrification in the anterior cingulate and dorsal nexus, shown right here. Um, so perhaps meaning that through continued using, like kind of like uh, going down a, a same path, you wear, you wear a path eventually, and, and perhaps that has a change in, in actually structural connections. And then this is showing that um, the dorsal nexus um, to default mode network has increased connectivity in adolescents at risk for depression. So it's not just necessarily the experience per se, because these kids had never had depression themselves, but they came from families with depression. Um, and then finally, um, turning to a non-medication form of treatment, looking at the effects of people who'd had, as I said, these are women with intimate partner violence, um, who had PTSD and then were treated with cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, what changed? Well, there were big changes. So cingulo opercular network, which is an important distinguisher of PTSD, default mode network, temporal and visual networks all were, um, all had decreased connectivity compared to what they had had before. So what we think was going on was that, that this, to, to sort of simplify it and do it in terms now of specific regions rather than of whole networks, we think that the increased amygdala anticorrelation with cingulate cortex exerted more control um, in both PTSD and major depression. So these are the double-headed arrows. Um, that, it that it interrupts the increased amygdala activity to insula. So you saw that other 
slide where people had looked at the connectivity with, with between those networks. Um, and that it interrupts insula to dorsolateral prefrontal um, frontoparietal networks um, in PTSD. Um, and then finally, that it restores the normal within default network connectivity, amygdala to subgenual, subgenual to medial nine, um, and um, the medial nine, which I interchange with dorsal nexus. Um, and then this rebalancing results in greater anti-correlation in the subgenual cingulate to medial nine, the default the default mode network. So you've got regions that are connected and anti-connected, and what you want to do is to be able to restore the normal anti-correlations anti and the normal correlations. So coming back to um, thinking about creative, creative artists, um, I, have, I have actual personal experience with saying that the default mode network activity may be involved in creativity because I was once the control subject for the conductor of the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> and we, we both were listening to Beethoven. And um, his default mode network w was wildly suppressed by listening to Beethoven's Ninth. Um, and mine was not. <laughs> mine was suppressed. <laughs> but there was, it was a very dramatically different uh, looking default mode network. And it was very interesting to hear what he said afterwards, which was that while he was listening, he was imagining himself conducting, and he was thinking about all of the social upheaval that was going on at that time, um, you know, when, when uh, Beethoven was, was composing this music, and, and a whole rich um, description of, of all of that. So it was, it was very interesting. Um, so I think the default mode network as a reflection of perhaps how good you are at doing another task is a, is a good indicator of, of um, some, some aspects of creativity and, and ability to focus on task. But does aberrant default mode network connectivity increase creativity? So perhaps um, as you're able to reflect on the visceral pain that you felt, perhaps it inspires you to create poetry or, or uh, very tempestuous music. So, so perhaps um, those are also aspects of, of creativity, although I would, I would say that um, you know, without periods of, of non-depression, you wouldn't be able to, to, to actually be able to do that reflection and to incorporate it. So I'm gonna stop here, um, just talking very briefly about some future directions. Um, can we identify brain circuits across disorders? Um, can we predict treatment for individual patients by using predictions from constructing these different graph analyses and support vector machines? Um, can we identify comorbid depression in other disorders? So we know that uh, disorders like diabetes, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, epilepsy, all have very high rates of depression. Is there a common effect on brain networks in those disorders? Um, and then finally, is there, what are the commonalities and differences of treatments induced uh, by uh, changes in connectivity? So antidepressants, cognitive behavioral therapy, electroshock therapy, vagus nerve stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation and deep brain stimulation all produce benefit in some patients, but not all. And so understanding what specifically the changes are in brain networks across these different modalities offers us a way to move forward to understand uh, which networks need to be tweaked in which patients and to individualize the treatment. So I'll stop there and just acknowledge all of this work was done in, uh, in Washington University, acknowledge my, my collaborators and my funding, um, and thank you for your attention. All right, um, we have time for questions.
So that was a terrific talk, wide ranging and really informative. So, but one thing gets my back up, having been trained too, too well in experimental methodology, and that's the post hoc analyses of artists. And my suspicion is that most depressed people never write poetry that gets published. And in fact, that there's probably a decrease mm -hmm. in productivity in most depressed people. So, and I think if we did post hoc analyses of certain great artists who were very happy people all their lives, maybe they were even more productive. So I would absolutely agree with you. Yeah. yeah. So Kate J Redfield Jameson's analyses really bother me because they put an onus on depressed people to feel even guiltier <laughs> that they haven't produced um, great novels and great literature and great symphonies. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I, I completely ag agree with you. I, I think what I was trying to say is that the experience during the depression, during a time when they're not depressed, may actually color their ability to, to have a different kind of experience than the rest of us. Thank you very much for uh, the wonderful presentation. And my uh, question is kind of bouncing off of that idea of uh, creativity as a result. And my question is, kind of more so grounded in creativity as a tool. And what I mean by that, it was brought up earlier before too of uh, this idea of not being able to recall or mm -hmm. put oneself into the future. And then earlier in your uh, presentation, you were referencing these artists who kept on using like the metaphor of blackness or darkness and this idea of not being able to see. And when uh, you were ta uh, explaining your experiment where you were showing images of fear to the patient. My question is uh, if you either have done it or what would you, would you, um, what would your hypothesis be if showing patients who have experienced uh, fear and, uh, and uh, fright with some type of care or compassion, like the reverse aspect of the visual connectivity of showing them not necessarily trying to see where the um, visualizing fear maps their brain, but what about visualizing compassion or like embrace, does that kind of serve as a tool to heal the, the effects of the depression? Um, I don't know how I would show somebody, you know, in a way that would be experimentally measurable an effect of compassion. I mean, there are some social science experiments where, that are more thought of as, as linked to, to moral, judgments about morality where you push people off trains <laughs> or, or don't. Um, <laughs> and um, say, but in so doing, save more people. I mean, so there, there are those kinds of things where you actually can make a construct like that. But I don't know of, of a quantifiable brain paradigm where we would show compassion. And I think, I think actually cognitive behavioral therapy is a form of compassion. It's, it's training people to be compassionate towards themselves so that they take in a, a bigger picture um, and they stop uh, beating themselves for things they don't have control over or take control of things they do have control over. Hi, very informative, uh, comprehensive presentation. I have a very basic elemental question about uh, neuroimaging and mm -hmm. creativity. How does creativity get um, uh, visualize in terms of with uh, what type of neuroimaging techniques uh, would you use? I don't know of a way to um, measure creativity in a scanner. I think the closest we get is we get people that we know are very creative and we have them do tasks and we look at how they do tasks compared to other people. And so I think the same kind of approach, for instance, has been used to study people who um, are multilingual, you know, very gifted at languages, and, and what parts of brain um, are different in when they when they have more than one language. Um, and so, the, in the same way, I think if you look at David Robertson's brain, you know, when he's conducting a symphony, this is for you know very different from the rest of us as we're listening to that music. So I, I think it's an, an unusually musical and creative brain that we're, we're watching the activity of. I wonder if I might just ask one final question for sure. this morning. 
Um, this region that you focused on towards the end of your talk that you called the dorsal nexus region, uh, and you showed very convincingly that it has different connectivity in people who have major depressive disorder or PTSD, and it seems mm -hmm. to be a marker of other kinds of uh, clinical disorders as well. So there's a sort of a two-part question. Part one is, what is that region doing? So that's a region, for example, from my universe of social and affective neuroscience, that is the single most commonly activated region when you ask people to make judgments or attributions about the current mental states or uh, enduring dispositional traits of another person. So it's striking that that region or sort of in that general vicinity is coming up as this dorsal uh, nexus region. So the first question is, what is it doing? And the second is, what does this differential pattern of connectivity mean? Is it a marker of abnormality or is it an attempt to compensate for deficits? Well, I'll answer the second one first. I, I think we really don't know. Um, the, the fact that there's increased connectivity even in um, adolescents who've never had depression and therefore haven't been exposed to this might, might mean that it's a sort of vulnerability marker, perhaps. Um, and as to what it's doing, I don't know that I know of any experiments where, other than your social science experiments, where that region is being called on to do specific tasks. And even in those experiments, there are a number of other regions that are co-activated, so it's sort of hard to, to tease apart. But I, I, I see no reason why that wouldn't be um, a region that would be involved in depression, since one of the things that's, that's really impaired is ability to uh, think about pleasure with other people. I mean, we, we sort of lose our social cognition as we become depressed, we become isolated, we become inwardly focused, um, we, um, we have increased uh, connections with our, our viscera, but not with our external social milieu. Great, so I just wanna leave Sorry, I just want to leave the speakers this morning and speakers this afternoon with a challenge, which is um, some of them have alluded to the fact, and your answer just alluded to this as well, that there's been a transformation in the way we think about brain function from focusing on singular regions to networks of regions. But then this just changes, this is, the problem is still no different than what we had 20 years ago when we just studied patients that had lesions to specific parts of the brain. The question is still, how does the brain organize the particular function that we're studying? It may not be a single brain region, but now it's a network, but then the question becomes, how do the elements of the network make specific kinds of contributions to the behaviors in question? So we have the, the nice way of fractionating different networks that Nathan talked about, and you can do this kind of word cloud of, here are the different kinds of tasks and functions people associate with these different kinds of networks, but it still begs the question, what are the computations being performed by the underlying systems? And I know you guys all think about this, but I just wanna highlight that this is a challenge for us uh, going forward. So with that, uh, we have a break for lunch, and what time are people supposed to be back? At two o'clock, we'll start the afternoon session. So let's thank all the morning speakers. Thank you.